Terrific. Can you see my screen? Okay. Awesome. So I, I think I even need to share it first. Uh, so uh, I'll I'll make some initial remarks. So um, today's topic of of focus is uh, an issue that's uh, particularly practical. Is uh, there's implications uh, for um, for programming. Uh, that are very significant, and uh, those applications uh, that formed the basis for the videos I, I asked you to watch from Bartosz Mielewski on algebraic data types. Um, uh, these data types uh, provide us uh, a very powerful ability to, uh, at several levels, um, uh, at the level of reasoning about a program, at the level of, of um, uh, compiling it in a, uh, in, a, in a fashion that is performant and uh, well matched to the uh, uh, to the hardware that we have available, um, it also supports easing programming at several different levels, um, most notably through automatic type checking. Uh, through intelligent suggestions uh, whilst programming from our, our editors uh, and uh, in the form of uh, routinely deriving functors uh, from higher level types on the basis of definitions of, of how lower level types uh, have functors associated with them, those horrendous construction. Um, so in other words, given functors we defined for low level types, we can, we can derive functors for composite types that are built up out of those lower level types. Um, in terms of clarity of reasoning, it, it, it builds on um, a very nice system where we have kind of this elegant basis set for defining higher level types in terms of lower level ones. Sorry, when I say high level composite types um, in terms of lower level ones um, that affords us um, a, a chance to reason mathematically, algebraically. And as we'll see, and as you will have seen in some of those lectures, uh, the videos, um, this reasoning uh, points back to basic features of um, mathematical operations that we've known about since grade school. Um, things with multiplication and addition. Um, and in the fullness of time, we learned about exponentiation. Um, and uh, you'll see that a lot of those invariants we learned in that context are reflective of the underlying mathematics captured through category theory and pop up in the context of uh, data types through when we're considering algebraic data types. Now, uh, as Bartosz points out, um, you know, the history of types in programming language is a varied one. And many have fallen for a view of types that's um, at once what I would call pragmatic, uh, but limited. Um, I might use the more florid term sclerotic. It's, it's kind of narrow and it perceives of types in a, in a prosaic way as telling us how to map programs to hardware, um, for example, um, how we're going to allocate registers to represent an int, for example, or a character or a, um, a floating point value. Um, you know, how we're going to lay out a record like a, a C structure. Um, but algebraic data types, um, you know, point to a, a vision of typing that's also represented in, in a very different literature um, and a literature well supported by theory. Um, in which uh, types 
uh, are not directly mapped to hardware. And we, we, we don't, we loosen this assumption that when we have a data type, it represents something that's reified in memory right now. Instead, we can have recursive data types, for example, which are infinite. Um, they're unbounded, I should say, in their, in their characterization. So think of like a list or which can be arbitrarily long or a stream or a tree, which can be arbitrarily deep. And uh, we can, in fact, allow for ones that, that are in fact unbounded uh, at an individual level, a stream of prime numbers. Um, uh, and uh, a tree with interior nodes that might uh, support uh, reasoning as deep as, as we'd like to go to, a, a stream that we could traverse arbitrarily far in each direction. Uh, and types are here to support us in our reasoning, to catch errors, to, to reason about uh, the behavior of the program and to allow for some uh, optimizations to support easy suggestions, to do support type inference, and rigorously driving um, types associated with areas of the program, but aren't um, tying us down to the requirement that all of our data structures have to be um, finite in size. Um, they might only be computed as we need them. And, um, and that's of course captured in Haskell's commitment to lazy evaluation, but it's something we see uh, in many other languages as well, uh, including uh, notably Scala on a elective basis. So algebraic data types um, provide a vision of typing um, that is at once pragmatic, um, beautiful, um, clear, uh, performant, convenient, um, and supportive, I would say. Um, and we're gonna start to take a look at some of the concrete ways in which they, they do that. And the ways in which this factors into concepts we've been exploring together, such as the use of functors um, in a way that's really quite pleasing. And which again points to some of these basic universal constructions in category theory, like products, co-products, terminal and initial objects, exponentials, et cetera. Um, and just as we have Cartesian closed categories, categories in which products exist and exponentials exist, for example, and often co-products, et cetera, um, as very powerful constructions, we could see this kind of basis set of, of, of operators at the type level provides us great power um, in generality. Okay, with those initial comments, I'm going to share my screen and we'll dive into some slides that are a little bit more specific. Just um, to remind people and revive, remind any uh, video listeners, um, uh, the original material, which I'm basing um, much or all of this uh, commentary is our a set of um, talks by Bartosz Mielewski. This last one isn't attributed to him, but it should be. I mean, I'm not, there's not the text that I should have used to say it's also by, by Bartosz. And these are from his uh, original category theory um, talk. Uh, and, and sketch out many, many features uh, that will be on which we'll be touching. Um, a few themes that come out of that. Um, one theme is that um, when it comes, this is, this is more broad, but it's really brought home in this work, then when it comes to category theory, um, and applications of category theory, um, rather than hitching ourselves um, in, a, in a restrictive way to the notion of equality as our sort of notion of sameness, um, 
we typically forsake that in order to, to adopt a looser notion of sameness based on isomorphism. Um, and this does reflect, as I've emphasized before, category theories focus on relationships as the um, as a as a key determinant of value of 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 meaning, um, the meaning of an object is defined by the role it plays in the category, the relationships it has with other other objects. So two objects which are isomorphic have basically the same relationships with the rest of the category. It's potato, potato, tomato, tomato. You know, um, uh, just different names for the same basic things and different labels for what's mathematically essentially the same. Uh, so we, we look to isomorphism as kind of our notion of sameness. So we don't, you know, we don't really get tied up in knots about whether something's a tuple of A and B or a tuple of B and A, um, you know, as a, as a product that essentially it's the same product. Um, or if it's an either A, B, so a co-product of A and B, either A, B, that we kind of view that as the same as either B, A. Um, and, and that's viewed as good enough. Um, the Haskell type checker isn't smart enough to recognize when two things are the same, um, generally speaking, but um, it's, it's to this higher notion of sameness that, that we, um, that we lean ourselves. And we often talk about properties being exhibited up to isomorphism. Um, uh, this is unique up to isomorphism. Um, meaning, look, if we put aside the kind of um, the normal uh, constraint that something may not be unique um, in the category because there are other isomorphic things, will consider it unique up to isomorphism. And so it's unique in the sense that anything else uh, that plays its role is isomorphic to it. And I did mention that we can routinely take a category where we have multiple objects that are isomorphic, and we create a so-called skeleton of that category, appropriate enough here as Halloween approaches. And, um, the skeleton of a category just collapses down objects that are isomorphic into a single object. They still have relationships from any of those objects, but the relationships are essentially the same um, for any of the isomorphic objects. So really that doesn't change the picture. We just cleaned up a little bit at the, um, at the level of uh, objects. Um, and we saw that, for example, product and co-product are associative up to isomorphism. If you have the, a pair of A and paired up with a pair of B and C, it's not precisely the, it's not precisely equal to a pair of AB paired up with a C, but it's isomorphic. It's the same information. It's just relabeling, reshuffling of things. It's the same information. There's no new information um, that's required to go from one to the other. Neither of them has particularly more information. Given one, we could just translate it trivially to the other mapping back and forth. There's an isomorphism. It's a function for one to the other and, and, and back. So product and co-product are associative up to isomorphism. Um, and initial and terminal objects, um, uh, um, now, we, we further saw it last time, moving on from this issue of isomorphism, um, uh, but it will be just in the background from now on. Uh, with product and co-product, we saw how they kind of interact with, as universal constructions themselves, how they interact with two other types of universal constructions, initial objects and terminal objects. And we saw that a terminal object was a served as a unit object with respect to product. So if we took a product of any other object with a terminal object, we'd get the object uh, back. 
we took a, let, let me phrase that again. If we have object A and we take the product of A and a terminal object, we get A back. Um, and similarly, if we have a co-product, we take the product, excuse me, we take the, so we have a, an object A, we take the co-product of it with an initial object, we get A back. Um, there it's A oh, or nothing, can't be anything, so it's gotta just be A. With the pair, with product, it would be, we have a pair of A with something that's always the same. There's no new information added. There's just a bunch of baggage being cleared around with no additional information or value. So it's basically just A. Now the product and, and co-product are commutative up to isomorphism. Um, and, um, and this should start to get you, oh, that, that's not that's spelled correctly. Commuta, okay, I don't know sure what happened there. Tativ, uh, up to isomorphism. Up to isomorphism, um, they have these, they have these initial and terminal objects that serve as units here, um, and it turns out if you consider products, co-products, terminal objects, and initial objects at a mathematical level, these form what are called a semi-ring or a rig, a ring without a negative. So they you can multiply and add, and and you get these well-defined properties and it turns out that some of the properties are in the form of our familiar distributive laws. So if you have A times B plus C quantity um, or A times quantity B plus C, I should say, um, it's, the, it's the same as A times B plus A times C. And we'll see a lot of examples of those in just a minute. Um, exponential objects here, represent to view of as kind of an it result of an iterated product. They also represent a function um, in SAD or if, if we're considering the, the category SAD, they represent functions in general. Um, uh, they will often serve in that way within the context of, of Haskell, um, the pseudo category for, for or Hask, the pseudo category for Haskell. Um, and um, recursive data types, it was emphasized, um, can be viewed as kind of equations that can be solved often in a way that leads to, typically in a way that leads to a arbitrarily long structure. And there's a forward pointer here to some of our work with co-limits and initial algebras or co-algebras. Uh, that we'll be seeing in a number of weeks time. But there's a, a notion of a fixed point there. Uh, so those are some themes. Now, one thing that wasn't really brought out in that particular discussion that much was just a reminder, you know, when, when we're talking about types, types are motivated by many reasons. And, and I think it was in, it was in one of the lectures I asked you to, to review that Bartosz talks about you know, for many types serving first and foremost as um, a guide to how things map to hardware resources. Um, so what things we can allocate in an integer register and what things have to go in memory and, you know, what things require dynamic allocation compared to being carried around on the stack, et cetera. Um, uh, and they do serve some of that purpose. Um, uh, there's a deeper way in which they get mapped, not in a one-to-one -one way with hardware resources, but a deeper way in which they can get mapped to hardware resources for these abstract data types and, and higher level types that, that's very powerful. Um, that allows us to reason about, for example, what could be done in parallel and um, how to optimize certain invariants that is missed if you just view them as close to the metal, kind of just directly mapping onto hardware. hardware. But, um, you know, they do provide some guidance on mapping to hardware resources in general. 
whether in a narrow sense, uh, the sclerotic sense or a broader sense. They can also help prevent a broad subset of errors. And you know, from the standpoint of software engineering, this is very, very important. They could avoid you doing a silly thing like adding a string to a floating point number, or at least you when you're in a well-typed language and not <clears throat> JavaScript. Um, uh, code transparency, um, having types can make it more apparent to the programmer, you know, what is something designed to represent? Um, oh, this is a hash table. Oh, that's an integer. That's an unsigned integer. This is a signed integer. Um, we can kind of reason about the roles they play through their types. Um, uh, and, you know, often we build up composite types which support sort of domain abstractions. Um, types can also allow for certain types of optimization. Um, uh, so knowing something can never be negative can prevent a lower end bounds check, for example, on an array or what have you. Um, and this is particularly true with algebraic data types. You know, we can use it for optimization. And then finally, some intelligent select uh, suggestions, for example, for possible matches. Uh, of a given value. Um, now there's some added benefits of algebraic data types besides these for types in general. Um, I, I've tried to list some of them here. So it's not an exhaustive list, but you know, they're a really nice kind of basis set for building up more complex types set of simpler ones. I mean, they're incredibly powerful and you could go build these arbitrary data types out of these simpler ones um, in a way that's, uh, you know, real clarity of reasoning and it's very powerful. It's this way of, you know, almost Lego-like building up a more complex structure um, out of simpler ones. If for absolutely key for many languages is the presence of powerful type inference engines that can make use of knowledge of the rules of algebraic data types to infer what type of given quantity is or what type of given expression needs to return in a way that avoid, you know, offloads the burden of explicitly typing everything within a program, explicitly giving a type to everything. A lot can be deduced. Um, and that that wouldn't be so easy if, if you just had an ad hoc typing system. Um, through algebraic data types, you have this ability to reason about the relationship of the outer type to inner, et cetera, that can be powerful in ways that would not be safe at something like C. Um, another thing is you can automatically derive functors. Um, so given functors on lower level types, you can derive functors for the composite types, the products, the co-products, the exponentials, the, so the functions, or, or sorry, or morphisms or functions, yes if we're working in, in a programming language as, as we're referring to. Um, and you can have intelligence suggestions um, that are particularly germane. Um, and you can optimize uh, in, in some powerful ways, potentially parallelize. So just as a reminder about isomorphism, um, you know, we might have two objects. Um, in this case, it's in set and we have Two objects that essentially contain the same information. You have mapping because they're they contain the same information. We can have a function going from one to the other and vice versa, the inverse function. And this shows an isomorphism. Um, and we consider these essentially the same. And in an arbitrary category, you can have this, where essentially uh, this try this. Um, this oval commutes um, and um, you know f after g, for example, if we if we do oh uh, okay yeah so this arrow f is going to this one um, it's kind of confusing with the way the arrows are written here but f goes to this one g so if we have f after g we must have started over here so g first and then f 
when you have to get something back to ID of D, if this is uh, kind of a, an isomorphic situation, um, F after G um, yields the identity. It hasn't changed this at all. Um, and uh, you'll recall, so this is kind of just recollection. You recall that we had said the product of any object with a terminal object in an arbitrary category is basically the same as the equality is loose there, but it's isomorphic to um, uh, to a itself. Um, and the coproduct of any one with a with an initial object is isomorphic to this object. Uh, and the product is isomorphic to zero. Um, well, maybe I'll, oh, uh, 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 where am I? There we are. Okay, this got terribly out of order, sorry. Um, what I really want to cover here was, uh, was this first. Okay, so based on these things, we could start to build up, um, you know, some, identify some regularities that hold and you know uh, quite a few of these were inspired by these lectures that you would have watched but i i put many of my own creation in here and what we see here is um is a the capacity to um reason formally uh, uh oh okay uh, these these should be these should be isomorphisms uh, there. Um, to reason formally in a way that's quite algebraic. So for all intents and purposes, the product of A and B is the same as the product of B and A. Uh, the co-product of A and B is the same as the co-product of B and A. Sorry, A and B is the same as the co-product of B and A. Um, A to the one um, powers the basically the same as this. And over here on the left, I'm showing kind of the general mathematical relationship. Over here on the right, I'm trying to connote what it would mean in Hask, for example. So, you know, AB is the same as this uh, from this perspective. Uh, they're isomorphic. The, the isomorphism is, as Bartosz notes, swap. Um, to go between them, you swap it. It's the same, you know. It's it, if you square it, it's identity. Um, so you could use swap to go this way or to go this way. Um, uh, here we have a similar kind of case in Haskell. We have a similar case-based way of saying, look, if you're in, if if you're in the left you know, return something on the right of that same value. If you're on the right here, return something on the left with that same value. It's kind of, um, it's isomorphic. You could have a mapping between them. Um, and in fact, like swap, that's that goes either way from this way to this way or this way to this way. Uh, here, the equivalent is like a function mapping from singleton to A. Um, it's a single, um, uh, a single value is picked out of A um, by this function. Either it picks out, you know, this element of A or that element of A or that element of A. Um, maybe A has three possible values. There's three possible functions. So these mappings from the singleton to A are basically one-to-one -one correspondence with them kind of be, can be viewed as these generalized elements of, of A. They play the role of elements of A. Um, and if we have the product like this, we've seen it sort of like, like that, we get this distributed law. And if you think about it, it's rather pleasing, right? Like if, if you give me a pair of an A and a B and, a C, and an either of B or C, Given that information, you give me an A for sure. And then I, I have something that's either a B and C. I could just give it back to you with equal information as a 
as a pair, uh, an either of a pair of A and, a and B, or, an, or alternatively, a pair of an A and C. Given one, I can just map to the other uh, losslessly. Um, it's, it's completely interchangeable. So the information in this is the same as this. Given this, we could create this or vice versa. Um, a plus one, this, this one is, what is this one? Can anyone speak up? What, what's that one? What is that one to know? Just like it did here and what it did here. What is one? It is- Unit. Unit, yeah, it's unit. In Haskell, it's unit. Here it's the terminal object in general. So these things on the left are true for, for any category with products and co-products and exponentials. These things of the right are for Haskell and in Haskell it corresponds to unit. It's the terminal object. Um, and oops, uh, in Haskell, you could kind of think of it like maybe of A or either this or this. This is just, you know, like a distinguished alternative value. Maybe we have a function that returns at A or it has an exception would just signal that by returning unit. Um, all we know is it blew up. Or whatever. Um, the product of, of an A with a A to the Bth power is actually one of these, A to the Bth plus one. And that may surprise you, but it kind of makes sense. Um, so if we have our one outright A given to us, and then we have a mapping from uh, a B to an A, what we really have is something that, you know, we can get an A out of nothing, or we can get an A out of a B, a just a B. So it's, it's really kind of the same as this, because um, maybe is, is A plus one. So um, here, we don't need a B to get an A, but if we have a B, we can get an A custom fit for that B. Um, if you have C to the A plus B, it's, so that's a mapping from A plus B to, to C, it's the same as C to the A times C to the B. This is the same as, and this is a really interesting one. This one might give you a double take. You should look at this carefully. C to the A plus B, this is a co-product here. And then we've got an exponential mapping down to C. Over here on the right, what do we have? What two operations do we have, or what two universal constructions do we have on the right? Do we have a co-product? No, it's a product in an exponential. Product in, yeah, in, in an exponential. There's two instances of the exponential. So this is a way of going from one to the other. It's kind of interesting. Um, I don't know if you folks know De Morgan's theorem, which is used in digital logic and logic uh, more generally. But um, if you have like negation of A plus B, you know, you can turn it into products, uh, right? Um, but, um, uh, uh, but here we have um, either A, B mapping to C, right? Um, you have an either an A or an or a B, you don't know which, you map it to C. It's basically the same as having two functions, one from an A to a C and one from a B to a C. Um, the information in this, because you've got to say, no matter which you have, an A or a B, how to map it to a C. The information in there has to handle all A's and, and map them to a C. It has to handle all B, possible B's and map them to a C. We have to handle whatever we're dealt, whatever cards we're dealt, we have to handle. And so you, you basically need information that's interchangeable with. Given this, we could derive uniquely one of these pair, pair, ladies and gentlemen, that's the product of which Wade spoke um, with mappings from A to, to C and B to C. So we could convert from from this co-product to 
to something that just involved an exponential to something that involves products and exponentials. To me, that's pretty cool. Um, and obviously you can go back the other way, right? But so it is with math, like the, the algebra, right? Um, somehow it seems cooler to me in category theory than it did with algebra. But I think this is pretty, I don't know. There's a soft spot in my heart for that. Um, okay, so A to the, a, B is a product to the C. It's the same as A to the C and B to the C. Um, and, and really, you know, in Haskell terms, let's say, look, if you have a map from C to pairs of A, B, it's the same as uh, a pair of maps, uh, C to the A and C to the B, right? All this does is it provides in one fell swoop for a given C, the value of A and the value B for that, both for that value C. But you could just as easily say, I'm gonna specify that in two parts. One of the maps to A from C, one of the maps to B from C. Um, here you go. Um, you have a multiplication of, of two, two co-products, product of two co-products. And you get the familiar thing that we've known for years, um, um, for years and years and years. Um, so um, I, I just got to tell Christine, I hope, uh, hope she's OK. Um, uh, OK. Um, and um, uh, OK. Um, um, and fast, uh, okay, um, okay, um, so, so this, you know, this can be expressed in Haskell as if you have a, a pair, right, that's what this is, the product is a pair, um, if we have a pair of, a either A and B, that's this one, or in, in an either C and D, that's that one, we can express it as, and I abuse the notation here, I'll call it quality ether just because I didn't want to put a horrible set of nested ethers. Um, but basically, you know, it, look, we, we got one of these on the left, or on the, the left is pair and we one on the right. So we could either have an A and C or, you know, or we have a B and a C or we have an A and a D and a B and a D, right? Um, yeah, you don't know which ones they are, but you got one of these or one of those. And so these are all possibilities. And so it is mathematically, so it is in terms of logic, so it is in terms of categories more generally. Um, uh, in my view, it's quite beautiful. Um, and then finally, if you have kind of a, you know, successor product here, um, exponential sort of double exponential, right? Uh, C to the B to the eighth power. You can express that as C to the C to the AB. Um, and what this is saying is, you know, like going A and and then B and then C is the same as this. That's Korean, right? Or it's uncurrying, uncurrying, um, uncurrying. Um, I don't know why you said. Currying, it's 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 currying slash uncurring. Um, uh, going left to right, it's it's uncurring. Um, uh, I find currying more tasty myself. But um, uh, if we have c to the b to the a, um, uh, that's the same as c to the a to the b. Uh, so here, all you're doing is you're changing it. it for instance, at Haskell, you're just changing. When you have a curried function, are you getting the A first or the B first, right? If you think about it, you could take the B first or you could take the A first. Um, just because also, if we were taking in an A and B as a pair, it's the same as B and A. So, you know, either way, you can, um, um, you can go in either order. Uh, so, so these are some things that just pop out of 
these sort of rules and hold for algebraic data types. And what's important to realize is they hold with any Cartesian closed category. Like these rules apply for, you know, an infinite number of different categories. I mean, there's all sorts of beautiful categories where things are not numbers and, and, and simple things. They could be combining categories. We're gonna see soon enough products of categories. But um, uh, these things um, hold for Haskell too. And they hold for high school algebra because that's, you know, one particularly simple categorical con um, sort of component. So this is algebraic data types. Now, Bartosz talked about uh, recursive data types and, you know, he did two clever constructions. And the first of them actually is one I've loved and treasured since um, my days as an undergrad. Um, you know, the equation for one minus one over one minus X as a power series. And, and that's cool. But um, the more general trick he showed subsequently is actually, well, it's more general, it's more, more transportable. So here, given a recursive data type, you could always iterate um, by substituting it in, substituting it successively. So here's the right-hand side, and where it refers on the right to list of A, we're going to substitute in this sort of thing. Um, and, and that will give us this. So all I did is I, I plugged in this to where it says list of A, right? And so what had been this, suddenly the list expands to be this whole thing here. Okay, okay. So there we go. Okay, what? Well, well it's, it's kind of messy, but we can always rearrange it. I mean, after all, we have like a nil here. So this is saying a list is either empty or it's uh, it's an appending of one thing to the to a list, right? And this list could be empty, or it might have a, things in it, and you can define it recursively. So this is an empty list, and cons is just like saying append them. It's a it's a beautiful list boards from the fifties that, that McCarthy created. A lot of those are referring to like register level operations on the computers at the time to which uh, John McCarthy had access at Stanford. And I think, I, I, I don't remember what cons means. I remember what car means. It's the contents of the address register and there's cutter and, and, and catter. Um, but I don't remember, maybe, maybe it is construct or something like that. I, I don't recall um, if anyone knows. Uh, I'd love to be educated. Um, so all we've done is we've substituted this in for list. And we get that. And so what do we have? Well, we have a nil as a possibility. And then we have a cons A and nil, right? Um, but really, wait, wait. OK, it's a cons A or, of nil or this thing. So we could separate these out. So we have a nil. Then we have a cons A and nil, OK? And then we have a cons A with cons A of list. Okay, um, that's a bit of a mouthful, but wait, this guy can be simplified to what? What is the cons of, a, of an A with an empty list? What does that basically mean? What information do we have? It's just information about the what. This is an empty list. What, what is this? What information do we have in this? Just the information about the all we have is all we have is the A. It's all we got. Then we have an empty list after it. So this is basically an A here. And then we have a cons of a cons. So this is it can be expressed as an A. It's isomorphic to A. Yeah, it's at the head of an empty list, but it's basically isomorphic to A. Nil is nil. This is isomorphic to A. Now this thing, uh, uh, okay, we got to expand it again. And so you go through and you expand that in the same sort of way. And, and then we're going to get a nil or an A. And guess what this is going to turn into? This cons A with cons A with nil, it's going to turn into what? It's a 
list that's headed by an A, the next element is an A, and then it's empty. What is that isomorphic to? A pair of A and A. The first element of the list, the second element. Basically isomorphic to it. Yeah, it's at the beginning of a list, you know, of an empty list, but basically it's the same information as a pair of A. This A and that A. And then we got this cons of A, of cons of A, of cons of A, of list of A. That's that came from this part of it. So we kind of separated out this into uh, a piece and dealt with that one and then we're dealing with this one. Okay, okay. So this is like an A squared or a AA. A. It's like two A's. And then, then you have this whole thing. And guess what this turns into? Anyone want to guess? What comes next after the two A's? What comes after an empty list, one A, two A's? Guess what comes next? Three A's. Three A's. Because this list is going to expand into a nil or its other thing. So the conse of conse of conse of nil is going to be three A's. And then the rest of the thing is going to have another cons, which is going to leave open the possibility of a fourth one. So this turns into list of A. If you expand this in this sort of brutal way, um, nil. It's either nil or it's A or it's AA or it's AAA or it's AAAA. Um, and I don't think you want me to continue, um, but it continues going for all possible natural numbers. Um, and this, this basically tells us the possible lists of different sizes, right? We could have either have an empty list or a list with just one thing in it or two things or three things, four things in it, five things. Um, so in general, with the recursive data type, you could do this for a tree. You could do it for a tree with internal nodes set of A's or only external nodes set of A's and with a stream and, you know, um, uh, um, that's a 2D structure, but um, it would get messy, but basically you can sort of derive what this is. And it turns out there's going to be an expansion of this. We're going on here and we're going on and on and on. But what we really want here, what the dot, dot, dot denotes is the fixed point of this. We just went on and on and on so that substituting one more time doesn't make any difference. It doesn't add any information. It's already there. That's the fixed point. That's the point where expanding it again makes no difference because it's already full out. Um, we want the fixed point. We want the thing that is so expanded that something like one more time gives nothing. We want the, the, the limit, or I think in this case, it may be the co-limit of this. And we'll come back to exactly this point with when we see catamorphisms and anamorphisms, because catamorphisms will collapse things like they'll fold up a list and anamorphisms will expand. And we again, take the fixed point of a recursive thing to get the full deal. This is like the full deal. This is basically this. It's a infinite data structure. It goes on as long as we want it, um, or it could be. It, it could be. It could be as long as wanted. It's arbitrarily long. It, it can terminate. A stream wouldn't have nil here. It would just be like one more thing, one more thing, like a stream of primes. Um, there ain't no nil there. So uh, there we would. We would have a, a you know, a, as many as we needed. Okay, this is a recursive data type. Um, now, I could go on and, and talk about how all of this supports functoriality, supports this automatically um, lifting things, um, derivation of functors. But I think I'll leave that till next time. And because uh, I want to also prime next time for a lot of discussion of questions. 
Any questions I could answer in our closing minutes here this time, uh, bearing in mind that I think we'll we'll spend a bit more time on this on Wednesday uh, before we 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 move on to the next uh, subject. So any any questions on any of this? Yes, uh, Li Xiaoyan. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, sorry. So for the least, um, I'm not sure whether I have missed or uh, uh, watching a video or something. Yeah. Here, I I'm not sure why um, uh, we consider pairs. Uh, um, yeah. It, it, it's like a product A A A. What, oh. Why is like this e instead of A plus A or something? Oh, because uh, so I think it has to do with the fact that cons is unfamiliar. So what cons does is it appends. It's like it creates a, you can be forgiven for thinking of it as kind of a, a tuple, a, a, a pair of an A with a, a list of A, okay? Um, and um, uh, that that's what it, creates sort of cons, um, creates a, a, a pairing up of this. This is not either this or that. This is the either, right? This is the either here. Yeah. This, this is yeah. the either. This is a pairing up. This is sort of saying an A followed by this. So when we have cons, if we have um, uh, mumble, um, uh, cons, uh, so I'm looking where it's expanded. If we have cons A, cons A with nil, then what's what's happening is we're we're creating um, as it were a, a pair of an A and an A and a nil. Here, when we just had cons A nil, this was like a pair of an A in a list that's empty. This is like a pair of an A with a pair of an A with a list that's empty. Um, and, uh, and so that's why it's like a, a pair of a, it's isomorphic to a pair of an A and an A, and there's nothing else, you know, in the rest of it. So it's just like an A and an A. I, does that help at all? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, suddenly I realized the, the bar is, is the co-product. This so, is the co-product. And yeah. it's it's and this is one of the things I was going to get into late in this. Um uh I, I worked on a slide for it. Like some of these things can basically be interpreted as, as co-products. So so here we have something that basically is like a co-product of this or that, right? Um <laughs> and this is like a product of these things. So um yeah. Hope that's helpful. Uh, yeah. Other questions or points for discussion? So when I was learning, when I was learning um, scheme 35 years ago, um, by the way, uh, Lisp was an old language by the time I was learning it in the mid eighties um, to give you a sense of, of antiquity. Um, but um, we actually learned less in scheme. I remember the diagrams well um, as, and you know, oh gosh, um, arrows like that. Um, uh, we, we would we would kind of draw out lists like this. So this would be like a, you know a three, and this would be a um, you know a, a sort of reference to the next thing. Um, this is like 
three and, and what's its next thing? It's like a linked list, right? Um, uh, was how it was drawn. And then the nil one will be shown like that. Um, or, you know, we might have another, another level of it, right? And, and consing um, at the beginning. So maybe, maybe initially um, th whoop, this thing doesn't, uh, you know, uh, uh, doesn't uh, initially uh, we're, we're not gonna have uh, three const onto this list. Uh, but um, so, so here we have a list and then we're gonna cons it with three. And so what we get is this out where it, it points there, this is the list we get out like that um, uh, from, from consing it with three. So um, it actually doesn't need to modify this part over here um, just because we've const it with this, because this is kind of prepended, um, but it just it just references that. Um, so this list, uh, you could be excused and, and encouraged even to think about this list as composed of a set of pairs, right? It's a pair of a of of, of a value a a thing of type a with a um, with with a list, um, uh, that's what that is. This is kind of the next element of the list. So a list here is represented as a as a series of pairs, kind of listed, and that's what this cons is. This is creating these pairs of a of a, of a value and a list um, here. That's what the job of cons is. And there's a thing called car, which gets out the first and critter which gets out the second um, and various more exotic things like catter that gets out the, the, the second one if this is non-null, uh, non-nil, et cetera. Anyway, um, bit, of, bit of history from the mid eighties. Um, I think you'll find the structure and interpretation of computer programs still. Um, anyway, any final questions here? We'll come back to this material next time and talk about functoriality because all these things allow automatically deriving of functors if you have functors for the lowest level things. Any final questions? Okay, maybe I'll just note for next time. Uh, I said um, optional, why don't you view the functoriality of abstract data types? And, sorry, algebraic data types. ADTs were overloaded terribly um, by the mid, by the early nineties. Um, ADTs were used frequently for algebraic, for abstract data types. Um, their use of algebraic data types was an additional use of it and I, I Unfortunately, my acronym storage is, uh, hashes them to the same bucket. Uh, so I sometimes say one is the other, but no, they're very different. Abstract data types, we're kind of talking about the C++ or, well, object-oriented abstraction and encapsulation, et cetera. Um, okay. Okay, so for next time, why don't you view this lecture on functoriality of ADTs and we will sort of finish up our module on this. We'll be talking about um, uh, product categories and by functors um, and, um, and how we can map, you know, given a pair, we can map to, um, we can lift two functions to map from that pair to another pair. And the same thing with either. So products, co-products, if this very nice um, functoriality. Um, and it turns out you get the same thing with function objects with respect to the second argument, but with the first argument, it's contravariant. Um, and you get, if you put two together, you get a profunctor. Um, uh, so anyway, that'll be uh, next time. Um, and this allows automatic derivation of functors given 
low level specification of the, the functors associated with their pieces. Um, okay, so that's all for today. Thank you folks. And I will see you next time. Have a good uh, weekend and a peaceful holiday and stay safe. It's really dangerous out there. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.